Hello, are you there? Yes, hi. How you doing? I'm good. Is this a good time? Sure, yeah. Awesome. Well, I just had a few questions. Um, first of all, I kind of wanted to ask you if you can uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, what made you decide to get into uh, hip-hop and make a career out of this? Uh, well, you know, the funny thing about that is that I, I don't know if I ever actually did decide. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I, I, I think the timing was good as far as my... Um, you know, me developing an interest in hip hop music because when I first heard it, I guess I would have been somewhere around eight years old, which I think is a pretty typical age for a kid to start developing uh, interests, you know, where a kid really starts to, you know, form their own identity and they, you know, they become interested in, in something that they become almost obsessed with and that really, you know, starts to form an identity. Sure. I think that's pretty common at, at around the age of eight. Uh, so I was just looking for something, probably like any other kid at that age. But, uh, you know, I'm old enough that at that time, hip-hop music was was pretty new. I mean, especially as far as, you know, records. You know, like, like I remember when, um, you know, the Sugar Hill Gang came out and Grandmaster Flash and those guys. Who was, it was brand new for most people outside of New York anyway. And I was at an age where I was just looking for something new. And so this thing really captured my imagination. And especially in those days, the spirit of the whole thing was really like, anybody can do it. You can do it too. Uh, you know, and you would, you would almost get pitched that way uh, all the time. I mean, it was very different back then. And it was very innocent. And a lot of it was just like in the name of fun. And, you know, often you would get these... Uh, you know, like k tell style records that would have like, you know, a little fold out thing inside that would teach you how to do things. Like you're always being encouraged to try it yourself, which I did. And, um, but you know, mostly I did it just like in my bedroom, almost in secret. And then, uh, you know, to make a very long story short, many years later, as I had just been, you know, kind of messing around, goofing around with it, not taking it seriously at all, I was more focused on trying to be a professional baseball player. Someone asked me if I wanted to make a record, and they offered to put it out if I did. And um, it was very flattering uh, to be asked. The thought hadn't occurred to me before, but basically once that gate was open, I just started running and never really looked back. Yeah, and I know that I first heard of you on um, an Anacon compilation. I, I don't know if people realize, but you've been releasing stuff pretty steadily since the early 90s. I mean, you had a okay. lot of stuff out. Yeah, uh, I think the very first thing I released that didn't really, you know, escape the, uh, you know, borders of my, um, you know, the city limits of my hometown uh, was, gosh, probably around... 91 or 92, and I've averaged at least one, you know, one thing, usually usually a full-length album or something close to it, just about every year since then. So it's a pretty big catalog now. What was the hip-hop scene like uh, in Canada at that time? Was it mostly just stuff from the States? or I mean, was there kind of a scene going on in Canada, too? Or? Um, across the country, like on a national level, there wasn't much... Uh, you know, there were a few things I can remember when, you know, there were the first few sort of breakout artists. One thing that was a really big deal here in Canada was when a woman from Toronto named Mishy Me uh, got signed to the first priority label, uh, which was run by uh, these guys in a group called Audio 2. And she was also working with KRS One and people from different people from the Boogie Down Productions camp. And so that was a huge eye-opener. Like, whoa, somebody from Canada is, is with these, like, you know, totally, not only legit people, I mean, the biggest names in the business at the time. I think that was probably around 86 or 87. As far as my hometown uh, goes, which, uh, well, not the town where I grew up, but where I was living when I got my star, which is Halifax, I don't. I don't think it's a part of the world that people know very much about, but it's actually uh, a town with a lot of pretty important black history, and so 
you know, where there's black people, there's black culture. And so there was always hip hop music there. In fact, um, there was a guy in 1979 who made a hip hop record in Halifax. Wow. So there was always something there. It didn't really get much notice outside of Halifax, but it's a pretty good scene there. And so when I got started, I was able to, you know, find, you know, a group of people who were active and that I could learn from and that I could play with and so on. And so, uh, you know, although they were never names that became known, it was, it was a real blessing for me to have a real community there to support what I was doing and for me to work my way into. So as far as that goes, I mean, do you have like a short list of people you would say were your big influences? I know you mentioned KRS-One or, I mean, were there any other big names that you can really draw back to? Well, yeah, there were definitely a few. I remember in those days when I first started, you know, really kind of getting into it and making my own stuff and writing, uh, you know, my own little verses and stuff. My favorites were probably MC Shan and Cool Keith from Ultra Magnetic. Okay. Um, because, you know, I mean, I was in a real small town, and there wasn't a big scene. There certainly, you know, the music certainly wasn't getting played on the radio, and you definitely couldn't go to a club to hear it. And so since it was mostly a bedroom pursuit for me and the other, you know, people around, um, I think a lot of the songs and artists that we gravitated toward weren't necessarily, you know, the the ones with sort of the hit singles or the songs that were hot in the clubs. You know, it, it tended to be the stuff that was a little more out there. And uh, I don't want to necessarily call it weird or anything, but I, I think guys that were you know, a little outside the norm uh, resonated with us where we were more because, you know, I mean, basically we were just like a bunch of nerds. We weren't cool people. And like I said, there wasn't really a club culture around it. So, um, you know, it, it sort of worked uh, and, and took hold in, a, I think, a different way in, in that we were in a kind of a weird, isolated place. Sure. I want to get your thoughts on this. We've had guy, we've had bus driver on the show before, and we've had dose one, and we've kind of yeah. discussed, uh, yeah, as you're saying, sort of that um, you know underground hip hop, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your thoughts on that exactly? I mean, bus driver, especially, I remember saying that that was kind of past, and there isn't really an underground scene. Or, I mean, what are your thoughts on you know Anacon and those sorts of labels? I mean, is that still an important presence? Um. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I've had that very same conversation with Bus Driver myself. He's somebody that I've toured with on a, on a bunch of occasions now. And I can understand where he's coming from and why he says things like that. I mean, you know, with the Internet and everything else, the playing field is, is pretty level uh, in a lot of ways. But it just really depends on how you look at it, I mean, you can really take a parallax view on this whole thing because on one hand, you know, realistically, if I mention, you know, hip-hop to your average taxi driver, you know, they know who maybe Jay-Z is, and they know who Eminem is, and maybe a few other people, and, you know, they certainly almost positively would never have heard of me, probably haven't heard of Bus Driver or Dose One or... And so, like, from that standpoint, I mean, there's just there's people that are really well-known that are basically pop stars, and then there's people that are at the you know other end of the spectrum from that. Now, having said that, something that always interests and, and frankly, surprises me is when I try to get a sense of, you know, what else uh, people like who are, uh, I don't know quite how to word this, like people who are fans of my stuff, and I hesitate to use the word fan. I've never been fully comfortable with the word, but I'm always interested to know what other hip hop artists they like. And sometimes it really is very mainstream stuff or big, you know, big artists. You know, like I'll hear from people say, "Oh yeah, I really like you and Lil Wayne," <laughs> and uh, that's a, that's incredible uh, to me. I, you know, how the heck. That happens, and I think that plays into Bus Driver's argument that, you know, I, I think it's a whole other discussion being, uh, you know, that's happening among a whole other group of people when, uh, you know, these different designations are being made and when it's looked at in sort of an intellectual way, because when it comes to the average person that's out there, you know, listening to the 
to the music, you just never know what the heck you know they're going to be into, and it's usually a very mixed bag between people that are you know superstars and people that are less known. But you know, I definitely came out of a scene that was like a pretty edgy or underground thing with the whole Anticon, you know, crew, and and by extension, you know, some of my peers were you know, people from the Rhyme Sayers world and the Def Jux world and things like that. And, you know, that whole scene that began to develop, I guess, at the end of the 90s and at the beginning of the 2000s, I mean, that was a pretty exciting and fun thing. And, you know, frankly, I kind of liked the idea of being part of something that was just, you know, outside and, and different and, and, and underground. I I always liked music that was underground and you kind of had to look for and work for a little bit to find and um you know not only that but i mean even even in recent years with my own stuff in a way it's something that i still almost encourage in a way because there's a lot of my music that i don't release in the usual way i'll just sort of let things sort of exist on the internet you know and if people find it they find it if they don't they don't. So I've I have whole albums out there that a lot of people don't even know exist, and that sometimes you know really surprises them to come to know that they do exist. And I I like that. I like the idea of of obscurity. I think that comes from me being a record collector and always really liking to you know really have to hunt for things. Sure. Well, I think I remember reading once too that you had mentioned you were at your happiest before you had more of the. Um kind of limelight and you were still kind of doing those albums where you were more unknown? Yeah, I don't necessarily think it was because of those factors, but I think I just approached it in a very different way when I had almost no expectations of anybody ever hearing it. And what that meant essentially is that, you know, early on in my career to be you know, perfectly frank about it is that the music I was making was extremely self-indulgent. And um, that feels good to uh, indulge yourself. And, and then it ends up feeling extra good if um, people like it, if people like what, you know, you've done when you were indulging yourself. That's, there's, that's very, very flattering. Yeah. And so, um, and that was definitely the case with my you know, first bunch of albums and the stuff that came out on Anticon. And, you know, after that, it, it sort of gets in your head a little bit when you know that there's, you know, anticipation or expectations, you know, for, you know, what you might do next. And you start thinking about uh, just, you know, other things, you know, pleasing other people in different ways. And, uh, and uh, you know, so at a certain point along the line, I... I wouldn't exactly say I was at a crossroads, but I sort of stopped and thought about it for a while, and it occurred to me, you know, I haven't just made a completely self-indulgent record in a while. Uh, you know, what would it feel like to just try to do that again? And I I did that, I guess it was about 2008, which was quite a few years ago now. I mean, I've done it several times since, but 2008 was the first time I kind of went back and took that approach after signing my record deal. And uh, it felt so good to do that. It kind of brought back the same joy I remember feeling when I first started doing it, when I knew the only people that would hear it would be my circle of friends. So then it seems recently, too, you've been adding sort of more diverse styles into your work, kind of moving away from that straight hip-hop style. Is that because of, you know, just wanting to make music for yourself and not worrying so much about what others think? Or? I think there's a few things going on there. Um, you know, one is that I like to just challenge myself and I always want to be growing as a well quote unquote musician um, might be a dubious claim for me to call myself a, a musician <laughs> but it's partly that and then I guess there's just another thing that happens when something like this becomes your life uh, you know is that you make friends and you meet other people who make uh, you know music and you know, just things come up, you know, where a friend will say, hey, uh, you know, do you want to work on something together? Or, you know, someone will just send something to me and say, hey, you know, I was working on this and I kind of thought you might like it. Um, and it could come from almost anywhere. And, you know, often from there, my thought is, 
well, you know, this is a friend of mine that I like to hang out with and spend time with. Yeah, it would be fun for us to just like sit down and work on something. Now that might be like a folk guitarist, you know, who I'm, you know, maybe met at a festival somewhere once, but just sort of hit it off with, or you know, an electronic, uh, you know, producer from, uh, you know, from Europe somewhere. I mean, you just never know who the heck you're gonna meet and hit it off with. Right. And so things just sort of happen in an organic way, and if someone you know, make some sort of offer like that, especially if it, if it, if it seems challenging, I'll almost always do it. I'll almost always take that challenge. First of all, just because it feels natural to do so, it would just be weird to, you know, say to a friend, oh, yeah, well, that's nice of you to offer, but I can't do it because it's not my style. It just, it, it, it seems that that's just not, you know, the way we, we work as people. Um, and so, you know, when I've had people say, hey, you know, what do you think of this? And they show me something that's way outside anything I've ever done before. More often than not, I've said, yeah, let's let's give that a shot and see what happens. And maybe we'll get, you know, something new, something interesting out of it. And so just staying open to those sorts of relationships and those sorts of possibilities um, has more than anything else led me to trying out a lot of different things over the years, mostly just through working with different friends. And... Um, and, you know, it's interesting to see what the reaction is to that. You know, on one hand, it, it may give you the opportunity to uh, find a new audience, but then there's always going to be some people who don't like it. it, it it's actually, you know, can be downright upsetting to some people who really want, you know, your new record to sound like your last one. But yeah. um, I have to keep myself engaged and interested and, uh, you know, growing and and so on. And so that's not to say that I'll fully turn my back on things because I still love to make music you know the way I did when I was young on my own in my bedroom with you know the bit of equipment I have kicking around but uh, there's almost no you know musical challenge that I won't accept well and as you're saying too I mean if you've been putting albums out for 20 years you I mean you yeah. have to do something to keep it from you know getting stale I suppose yeah yeah I mean you know that's exactly right and um I mean, I, I think another thing that most musicians do or want to do, whether they're even really conscious of it or not, I think this is just the way our egos work, is that you always want your thing to grow. You always want it to grow. And so I think that leads to, in some cases, a willingness to try out new things because the thinking is, well, you know, uh, if this works, you know, maybe it will, you know, be the one song of mine finally that you know, someone likes uh, who never heard or liked anything that I that I did before. Um, so, you know, a couple of years ago, through a few mutual acquaintances, you know, I met a guy who was a producer from Sweden who had a background in in doing like sort of pop stuff. It was it was still sort of beat driven, um, and it was like you know mostly electronic, but but. Uh, but you know, it was it was a little slicker than anything that I the uh, than I had ever done before. Uh, but he was a great guy who had a great sense of humor and just someone I really you know hit it off with. And when one day he just you know sent me a beat and said, "Hey, do you want to do something with this?" Um, you know, I th I thought, yeah, sure. You know, let's do it Cause just because it would be uh, you know fun to do something with him and let's just see you know kind of what the reaction is to it and. And it's amazing because, you know, some people will really love it, but you get some people who freak out, like, what the hell is this? You know, why have you done this or whatever? But, you know, I guess a lot of people don't really think or consider, you know, what goes on behind the scenes or that you're just like a human being and that you have friends that you hang out with and and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, I just, you know, tend to keep things as organic as possible and mostly have just worked with my with my friends uh, through the years rather than, you know, going out and seeking people to work with that I've uh, admired. That's not to say that, you know, these haven't been some very talented and in some cases well-known people. But, um, yeah, when I'm not working on my own, it's usually, well, put it this way, I'm lucky enough that, you know, if I ever need somebody for anything if i ever need a a certain kind of singer if i ever need a guitar player ever need a drummer and whatever i usually know someone i usually have a friend at this point in my life who's you know very talented that i can turn to 
find somebody that I have a certain level of comfort with um, that I can work with. And it's led to a very big and diverse body of work. And, you know, it has its pluses and minuses, but a big plus that I was reminded of earlier this summer was playing a festival. And right before I played, uh, I was playing with a new kind of younger band who had only just released their first album. And they were playing their set, and it was not working. The crowd was not into it at all. But there was nothing they could do because they only had about 10 songs to play. So all they had to do was just endure the thing and finish playing their songs. But as I was watching all that happen, I was able to size up the crowd, get a sense of who they were, what they wanted. I was able to bear in mind the night of the week, everything else, and say, you know what, I have about you know, 3,000 songs to draw on that I could play. Tonight I'm going to go with this group of songs because I know that's what's going to work best. And, and it did. You know, and that's a huge plus for me, having as big and diverse a body of work as I do, is I can adapt to almost any situation now, play for almost any crowd, uh, and you know, just make almost any situation work in one way or another. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, getting back to um, you know what you were mentioning before about being surprised to see your name listed amongst others, you know, as people discover your uh, your work. I noticed a few people that I was surprised that knew and enjoyed your work found out who you were through the Trailer Park Boys TV show. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Does that come up often? or You wouldn't believe how much that comes up. Uh, and I get it everywhere. Uh, it just It's amazing how popular that, uh, you know, show is around the world. Um, and it's a really hard thing for me to get perspective on because, once again, Um, you know, these are people who are friends of mine, uh, going way back. Um, so, uh, you know, the guy who created and directed Trailer Park Boys is not only someone who I've, uh, known for a long time and long before Trailer Park Boys started. Interestingly enough, we shot a music video together probably back somewhere in like the early to mid nineties that in a way, looking back on it, was sort of a blueprint of Trailer Park Boys. Wow. Because it was filmed in a trailer park, and it really had that sort of vibe. And a lot of people who ended up on the show were in the video. So I, sometimes I wonder if the seeds of the whole thing were planted on, on this you know, <laughs> video a long, long time ago. Um, but... Uh, Yeah, you know, my friend Mike, who's the creator of the show, at one point says, look, I'm doing this thing. You know, here's the idea. There's these there's these sort of like vaguely, weirdly, you know, gangsterish guys uh, in this trailer park. And I need them to have like a bunch of ridiculous music to listen to when they're driving around in their car. You know, can you just make some stuff for me? I remember I did almost all of it in a day. I just sat there making all sorts of ridiculous songs and really had no expectations of it really becoming much of anything because this guy Mike had tried a million things before that never really worked. I I shouldn't say a million, but, you know, he was doing like cable access TV shows and stuff. And then the thing just went uh, totally bonkers. It became huge. And I was, you know, playing shows. I remember what I knew the thing was big when I was uh, playing a show in the Netherlands once. And I had someone coming up to me really freaking out about it. Uh, and, you know, this was all stuff that happened just like, you know, in my hometown among my friends. It was very difficult to get perspective on it existing outside of our area because it seemed so, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, like it had such a sort of a local specific, you know, flavor to it. Um, and uh, anyway, you know, the audience for that thing was huge. And so e- every night, I mean, I just got back from tour and, I don't think there was a night that went by that I didn't have at least, I would say, half a dozen people uh, come up to me and say something about Trailer Park Boys. It happens every night without fail. So I guess that's another reason why you don't turn down people if they want to collaborate with you on things. You never know which one might uh, be huge overnight. Well, you know, I mean, that's that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, I you know, I, I am always interested in, you know, hearing other people's ideas. And I think collaboration is fun and often brings out, you know, different sides of yourself, which is always good and positive. 
but it's true. Uh, you know, I've met a lot of people over the years, uh, you know, who I worked with. Well, not a lot. I mean, I guess it's a small percentage of the people you meet along the way, but once in a while, you know, somebody that you, um, you know, you meet and you encounter along the way, you know, turns out to be a, a, a superstar. And it's, it's, it's really, really hard to predict because I'll tell you what, it's not always the most talented people that that happens for. Uh, so you, it's true, you never know. Well, and as you mentioned, you uh, just wrapped up a tour, and uh, you, you're starting up another one. I know you have a show in the Triple Rock. Yeah, that's and right. You've played Minnesota quite a few times, I know. What are, you, what are your thoughts on playing here? Well, I mean, in my mind, I can't really separate my experience in that town from, uh, you know, the whole, uh, you know, Rhyme Sayers thing and, and, and Slug and just everything that he built there because... You know, I've played around the world, I've played all around the United States, and you just never know what the scene is going to be like from one place to the next. I mean, there's certain places you go, you expect it's going to be big. London, you know, New York, Los Angeles, places like, like that. But then, like, to go into a place that's not, you know, one of those cities that comes to mind right away, and you see this giant, incredible scene where it's not just big for them. I mean, they're... You know, Slug is such a community-minded guy, and, you know, the people that he surrounded himself with, that it's not just about them and them turning themselves into superstars. They've just built up a scene and an audience, you know, for this kind of music. And so even in the early days before it was built up in other places, you know, I could go to, um, I don't know, Cleveland and play for 25 people, and then, you know, go to Minneapolis and have have it be hundreds of people at the show. And, you know, there was never any doubt, no question in my mind that this was attributed to all, you know, the groundwork that was done, you know, with Slug and his friends through their endeavors, whether it was radio shows or the record store that they had or just whatever, you know, they were doing to kind of get the word out about this scene and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. They've worked so hard, and they've built, you know, what is something resembling a Shangri-La for an independent hip-hop artist to go to to play. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And so it's a place I always look forward to going, and the crowds are always great, and it's always so fun. And now it's a place I can go and just see tons of familiar faces and um, so, you know, I always, always look forward to it. I always can't wait to get back. And I was, I'm wishing, you know, that I would be able to, you know, just stay for a while after and hang out with people and everything. I'll stay as long as I can. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really just one of the best places in the world to play. Awesome. Yeah. Well, again, it's been great having you on. And uh, you are a busy guy, obviously. So do you have other upcoming projects or is there a new album? You're probably always working on something. Yeah, I am. Uh, just literally 10 minutes before you called, um, I heard from uh, you know one of my main collaborators from Belgium, my friend Joël, with whom I have a project called Bike for Three. And uh, we released an album in 2008, if I remember correctly. And she just sent me a brand new song we're just, uh, that she just finished mixing tonight. So we're just putting the finishing touches on a new album, uh, which will be out soon. And I finished a new Buck 65 album. Well, in fact, we're just finishing mixing that. I think the last song for that got mixed maybe yesterday. So I've basically got two new albums done. And uh, I'm also writing a book that I'm hoping to have finished by the end of November. So all of these projects will be coming out next year. So 2014 is going to be a real busy one, I think. Awesome. Definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. It's going to be a good one. Well, again, I'm a huge fan, and uh, thanks for being so gracious with your time. Yeah, no problem whatsoever. Thanks for uh, you know reaching out, and uh, you know, be sure if you have the chance to come say hi at the uh, show on the second. All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot, man. No problem, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right, have a good night. Thanks, man. See ya. Bye bye. Bye.